We all know everybody poops, but sometimes what we leave behind can be deadly. This week, I have stories about when someone used their, well, toilet paper to remove themselves from the world. When a royal party was all but wiped out, pun intended, by a castle's effluence, and when a giant metropolis became so consumed by human filth that it led to the death of tens of thousands. I'm issuing a no snacks until I say otherwise warning for this one, unless you have a firm stomach of course. Let's start where we left off last week, in ancient Rome. You didn't want to be a gladiator. It wasn't a glamorous or happy life 99.99999% of the time. You were amongst the most enslaved of the enslaved, worth nothing more to the Roman elites than the moment's entertainment and whatever they could get for you on the open market. You were a lump of meat sacrificed to placate the masses, a circus to go along with their bread. It was true that the old thumbs-down sacrifice of losing the gladiator in combat wasn't as common as the movies tend to make out. Gladiators were worth a lot of money, so if you had the power to take one out, you'd then be expected to compensate the owner. It was also true that you could sometimes, if you were really good and really, really lucky, win your freedom. But the most likely outcome was that you'd be a lion's lunch or the dinner for a pack of wild dogs. Now, that's not as bad as what happened to Roman miners. I have a video you can watch next if you like, if you want to know about that. But it was pretty bad. According to a Roman philosopher called Seneca, who lived at roughly the same time that a bloke called Yeshua bin Yosef is thought to have been causing a bit of a stir back in the Middle East, one gladiator had decided he didn't want to end up in the belly of a beast. He was a gladiator at the end of his training, and it was all going well, a bit too well if truth be known. He was not far from actually fighting in the arena, and he needed to find a way out. To do that, he needed some privacy, and there was only one place where the gladiators could get some, the latrines. This is actually a strange bit of the story, by the way, because Roman loops weren't particularly private. Rome was one of the first places to have proper toilets and sewage facilities. They weren't the actual first, the Sumerians got there earlier, 3500 BC, with a big pit with a tube on top. But it was the Romans who had the first public dunnies. These were long rows of holes, carved out of stone or concrete, often accommodating as many as 60 people at a time. Your business, and by the way they did sit there and do business, would drop through a hole into a chamber where a constant trickle of running water flowed, pushing most, though not all, of the solid matter into the impressive sewage systems. One such system was the Cloaca Maxima. It's a stunning piece of architecture in Rome. It was built originally in 600 BCE as open air channels that allowed surface water to flow into rivers and streams. Over time, the channels became grand tunnels, and those grand tunnels were covered by stone slabs, and eventually roads and buildings. By the time our gladiator was getting ready to do his business, the sewers were so big, a cart could be driven through them. At least, that's according to another philosopher called Strabo. The one in Rome wasn't the only impressive sewer built. There's another that exists, or at least some of it does, called the Eberacum in York, England. They were way ahead of their time but they weren't perfect. For a start, the sewage system tended to get blacked up, attracting flies would lay their eggs in the billions. They also stank pretty badly. Sometimes, to get rid of the stink and the flies, people would be given the job of going through one of the ornate manhole covers to clean the blockages up. If you want to know more about them, I've been thinking of doing a video on the grossest jobs in history. Let me know. The trap poo could also create methane which would build up, meaning that there was a non-zero chance that our gladiator might get his undercarriage singed, or worse, by exploding ass gas. Poor Romans, who had to take their dumps in pots and then pour them into the sewage system, or the street, tended to get bits of broken pot, smooth them off, and then use them to scrape any Klingons from their starboard bows, before throwing them away. We've even found shards of pots in latrines with people's names written on them. As it's unlikely this ultra-hard toilet paper was reusable, the theory is that these were the names of people's enemies, and this was either a dedication to the goddess Cleokina, who presided over the sewers, 
or it might have just been a kind of cathartic insult. It does work as a catharsis, by the way. You should try it. But if there was one perk of being a gladiator, it was being allowed to clean your back end like rich people do using a xylospongium or tesorium. These were basically natural sea sponges tied to the end of a stick and dipped in a pot of vinegar or salty water. Now, as sources are vague, and for example Seneca refers to the xylospongium as something used to clean the obscene, some historians think these were used for cleaning the loos themselves, but most think they're what wealthy Romans wiped their backsides with. A quick scrub with a spongy end before being stuck back in the pot, ready for the next person to use. So, there the gladiator sat, alone in the latrine, no guards to watch over him. This was his time. A chance to travel another path. He took hold of a xylospongium and jammed it so hard down his throat he choked until he no longer breathed. Seneca, it's fair to say, was impressed with this gladiator. He wrote, It was not a very elegant or becoming way to die, but what is more foolish than to be over nice about dying? What a brave fellow! He surely deserved to be allowed to choose his fate. How bravely he would have wielded a sword! If nothing else, it gives you an idea of how terrifying it was to be a gladiator that someone thought that swallowing a bog brush used by his fellow gladiators was a better fate than stepping into the arena. Eventually the Roman Empire collapsed, and so did the use of their sewers. For about the next 1500 years, people mostly punted their dung out into the street so that people called nightmen could scoop it up and dump it into open pits. That's another bad job for the jobs video. There were some public loos like in the Roman days, but they tended to drain into cesspits right under the property. London diarist Samuel Pepys, who lived in the 17th century, was slightly obsessed with his bodily functions, it's fair to say, and he spent quite a bit of time on what he called his house of office that drained under his house. One Saturday morning, October 20th, 1660 to be precise, his neighbour came to warn him of a little issue. Samuel wrote, this morning one came to advise me where to make me a window into my cellar in lieu of one which Sir W. Batten had stopped up. And going down into my cellar to look, I stepped into a great heap of turds by which I found that Mr. Turner's house of office is full and comes into my cellar, which do trouble me. Yeah, it troubled me too. However, if three separate period sources are to be believed, which may have copied from each other, but maybe not, the worst thing that happened during the time of the cesspits occurred 476 years earlier in Erfurt in the Holy Roman Empire, an area we now call Germany. It was July 16th, 1146, and the local ruler, King Heinrich, or Henry VI, was coming through town. At the time, there had been a bit of a spat between two local powerhouses, Louis III of Thuringia and Archbishop Conrad of Mainz. The reason they wanted to remove each other from the planet has been lost to us, but this is in a period where there was little love lost between royalty and the church. The investiture crisis, which, to cut a story so short that some of my medievalist friends are going to hate me, was basically when the Pope told the kings of Europe they couldn't pick their younger brothers to be bishops anymore, and the king said balls to all that, leading to anti-popes and all sorts of chaos. And that had only ended a few decades earlier, so things were still quite sore. Heinrich wanted to heal some wounds, and although he was on his way to fight a war in Poland, he had a little time to spare, so he called for a diet, a sort of big meeting, where the two sides could hash out their issues and come to an agreement. It will be held in the most impressive building in Erfurt, Petersburg's Citadel. Heinrich knew that because the rich have always liked an entourage, there'd be quite a lot of people coming. So he decided to use the great hall in the deanery on the second floor, because in there there was a table big enough for up to a hundred nobles. It looked like the right spot, but there were two things Heinrich didn't know. First, there was a massive latrine filled with all the refuse of the people who worked and lived at the citadel directly under the deanery floor. And second, the floor of the deanery was rotten. Heinrich sat in a stone alcove at one end of the table. 
Louis found another nice spot in another stone alcove and sat there, and the remaining visiting nobles and their people took seats on wooden chairs that rested on the broken floor. Then there was a sudden, violent cracking sound, and the entire floor in front of Heinrich and Louis fell away. Some died instantly as they hit the floor below them. Some were killed by falling debris dragged down by the floor as it collapsed, but most of them fell straight into the latrine. Because their emperor was going to be there, a lot of them were in their heaviest Sunday best go-to-meeting armour. Even if they weren't, it wasn't a time when many people knew how to swim, and even if they could, the gas from the excrement was so thick that they couldn't breathe. So, around 60 people filled their lungs and their stomachs with human waste and breathed their disgusting last. Heinrich and Louis were helped down with ladders. Louis presumably thought the conflict was resolved, and the Emperor got the hell out of there as quickly as he could. He had less gross things to do, like attack Poland. I mean, what is it with Germany attacking Poland anyway? Over 700 years later, in 1858, Michael Faraday, the scientist who gave us cool things like the electric motor, the inspiration for field theory, and the Bunsen burner, stood next to the Thames. He wasn't happy. Despite a little sewage system being built around London using 360 underground pipes and the Fleet and Warbrook rivers to flush waste into the Thames, things hadn't really got much better than they had been in Pepys' time, or in Heinrich's for that matter. What made it worse is that a lot of these makeshift sewers were in desperate need of repair. Gases and other stuff leaked out, and they could be revolting on a hot day. And then there was the Thames itself where it all ended up. It wasn't great when Pepys was alive, but that was when the population of London was around 400,000 people. By the 1850s, it was over 3.1 million. All those millions of poops a day would go into the Thames and get washed up on the shore. Like the gases, hot weather made that stink even more, and in 1858, it was sweltering, often rising to as high as 48 degrees Celsius, or 118 degrees Fahrenheit. Not only did the stink get worse, the Thames got lower. According to Faraday, the feculents rolled up in clouds so dense that they were visible at the surface. Meanwhile, on Friday, July the 2nd, Reverend Blackwell and his wife and his four kids were doing their best to enjoy their riverside house in Belgravia. It likely hadn't been pleasant. They were right in the path of the stink that had worsened as the days got hotter. Sometimes they would have hardly been able to breathe. That day, the Reverend and his wife suddenly collapsed. When people entered his home to rescue him, they found out that two of his young daughters were lifeless inside. Then, on Monday, despite having left the house, another of the Reverend's children passed away, and his eldest daughter just about clung on till Tuesday. They were all taken by the stench of the Thames and the diseases that come with it. An anonymous letter sent to the Times newspaper from The People of the Capital Slums summed it up best. We live in muck and filth. We ain't got no privy, no dustbins, no water supplies, no drain or sewer in the whole place. If the cholera comes, Lord help us. It did, taking 14,137 lives. Parliament sat in a panic. Something had to be done. Gases were taking lives, as were diseases like cholera brought on by, they thought at the time, foul air. The leading theory of disease was miasma that bad smells made people ill. And that was even though that Jon Snow, no, not that Jon Snow, that Jon Snow, had managed to trace some cholera outbreaks to a specific water pump at Broad Street four years earlier. The upstart's fancy schmancy germ theory wasn't yet widely accepted. Sadly, Jon wasn't around to argue for it in 1858 because that year he died himself, likely from the various anaesthetic gases he kept testing on himself. Not only did John think tiny bugs were responsible for disease, he also thought it would be great if people didn't feel pain when they were having their bits chopped off. I'm honestly surprised no one thought to call him a snowflake. 
So, their plan was to get the stink as far away from the bit of the river where wealthy people lived, i.e. the west, as they could. The prevailing wind in London was west to east, and that meant pumping it further down the Thames to where the poor people lived, I mean, to a spot where it could get washed out to sea. So one of the most astonishing construction projects in history began built using a series of pumping stations to move the poop away from the city centre. It mostly worked, however there is that one instance when an overloaded pleasure cruiser sank right after a pump had dumped 31.7 million tonnes of human waste into the Thames in their path. But I've already written about that for the fabulous Scary Interesting channel. Link below if you want to see what happened there. This story isn't quite over. Human excrement is still being flushed into the Thames when the system can't cope, which is why they're building a 5 billion pound, 60 mile or 25 kilometer super sewer called the Tideway to take it all right out to the Thames estuary and then the sea, which is excellent for the people who live out there. Gives a whole new meaning to South End. Thank you for watching this episode all the way through. It's safe to go for your snacks now. It's also safe to poke the like button and wipe that subscription thing if you haven't already. I've also got memberships going on now, I hope. There I'll be uploading uncensored versions of all the videos, extra videos where I talk about history and science things, like the video going up this Wednesday about the sound we used to make when things were gross, and access to a private Discord to chat where you can give me topic ideas, and live streams where we can talk about extra gross things. Maybe you can tell me what grosses you out. So please do consider joining if you're able. It'll really help support this channel and let me do this all the time so that I can stay gross, because gross is good.